That's the injunction that I want to start with this morning. Seek first the kingdom of God. I could probably sit down now. Because those are the very words that God, through Jesus Christ, wanted his people to know. It's why God sent Jesus. He wanted, him to, wanted us to know that his kingdom was breaking in to the kingdom of this world, the kingdom that had been in rebellion, the kingdom that had been taken away from Adam. The story that had been spun by the evil one said, you cannot trust God. God is a liar. That's what had been said about God up until the point that he invested in a people called Abraham and said, I want a people who will follow me and I'm going to reveal myself to that people. And then told them that there would be a man who would come. Didn't he tell Eve that? Isn't that why Eve named her first child Cain? All you Bible scholars, I know that you know this, but I'll just tell the rest. Cain means, I have acquired. I have acquired a son. This has got to be the one. This has got to be the one that will save his people from their sins. At that time, just Adam and Eve. But that's what they had been told. There will come a one who will save. Well, it wasn't until many, many, many years later and many, many generations later that Jesus came. Now, at Sabbath school today, we had the opportunity of opening up the book of Romans. I want to encourage you all, as I encourage the class at the end of today, please read the book of Romans again. It's going to be important. The exam is coming very soon. It could be this week that somebody is going to ask you, how is it that we are saved? I am hoping that you will have an answer to give for the one who has saved you, the one who has given his life, the one who came, the one we believe is the one who was to come. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe that he died and was resurrected on the third day. And as such, he fulfilled his own words where he said, I will lay down my life and I will raise up. I like to believe that my knowledge is also growing as I hope your knowledge is growing and I don't know that I really knew that or believed that in my soul until I reread it again some time ago that Jesus was not killed by the Jews Jesus was not killed by the Romans Jesus died of his own accord it was part of the plan It's good news. In fact, it's the best news ever. Romans tells us how it happens and the legalities of it all. And it also tells us that there are going to be people who will come along and say, you know what? There's Jesus and. So if, if you haven't got a book to study with, we can give you one of those. It's called a Sabbath School Quarterly. But if you don't have that, just take out your Bible, dust it off. Sorry, that was bad. I shouldn't say that. It's got, I know, I know, it has dust because now you have your Bible on your phone. Yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. Okay. Dust it off, get it out, and read Romans again, please. That, and that's just, that's just where we start today. I've entitled our time together, um, Live, Laugh, Love. And if you come back to this room that has been so wonderfully decorated by uh, the people of this church. They call it the pastor's office. Thank you. It's, it's very nice. Uh, but I put a couple of uh, pieces up on the wall, and one of them says, live, laugh, love. And there's many people who like that three-word phrase 
And so they have maybe put it on as a tattoo or maybe they have it, you know, some other place. But it reminds them to live, to laugh, and to love. And I have called our time together, Live, Laugh, Love, because I believe that we want to live, to laugh, and to love now and forever. I don't know if that's the goal of your life, if you've ever stopped to think why I am here on earth, but I believe that if God has created me, that he has created me to have life, and Jesus even said, I've come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. Uh, I love the idea of the cup. The cup is a symbol in the Bible of your life, and he says, I'm going to give it to you uh, pressed down. Don't you love it when you go to Baskin Robbins? And you see the guy with the scoop, and, and you know he's your friend when he takes that cone and he digs deep. And then he puts it on and he digs deep again. And he puts it on and it's big and it's overflowing. And you're thinking, I'm getting my money's worth. I'm coming back because it was pressed down and running over. I like that. That's why I like Ben and Jerry's too, just to put a shout out to Ben and Jerry's. They, they suck the air. Did you know that? Do you know that's why Ben and Jerry's, you can hardly put a spoon in it? They literally, they suck the air out of the ice cream. All the rest of the people, they sell you that, you know, that pint of ice cream and it's half air. But Ben and Jerry's, they take the air out. It's like a rock. Love, Cherry Garcia. Yes, indeed. Okay, anyway. So, enough about ice cream, but just know that it's pressed down and running over. And this is the kind of life that we want when we say that we want to live, laugh, and love. And we want it now. And we believe that Jesus Christ has promised it to us now. And that we are hoping and praying because we cannot even imagine what it's going to be like to be in heaven. Where it will be also living, laughing, and loving loving. We've been traveling through the disciples' prayer. And again, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, we have renamed, I have renamed the, what is typically called the Lord's Prayer. I've, I've renamed it uh, the disciples' prayer. Because if you want the Lord's Prayer, where do we go? Those of you who heard me before, you go to John 17, where Jesus prays, Jesus himself prays for his disciples. That to me is the Lord's prayer. The Lord is praying at that moment. He is praying for us. The ones you have given me, Father, take care of them. Please help them. Uh, he gives over his, his care for his own disciples to his heavenly Father in that prayer. But in the disciples' prayer, you're in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is uh, considered to be uh, Jesus' magnum opus. This is his, this is his big sermon. This is the, the place where he un unloads, unpacks all of the things that he is about, the reasons he has come. And in the midst of this, his disciples ask him to teach them to pray. Remember, Jesus is a rabbi. He's being looked at as a rabbi. He is being looked at as a potential candidate to be the Messiah. And I, I say that in that way because now I'm talking as if I'm one of his disciples. And I've reminded you before and I'll remind you again. The fact is, uh, at this moment in time, I, uh, the disciples are unknowing, really. Un understanding. They are ignorant, as it were, of the real meaning of the Messiah's coming and their part in it. They're ignorant of it. At least if, if they're not ignorant, they're playing dumb because they picked Jesus. Well, Jesus picked them, but they picked him to follow him. The crowds followed him because they believed that he might be the one. Josephus again tells us there are many other Christs Many other people claiming to be the Christ. So just quick parenthesis, if there are other Christs claiming your allegiance right now, people you are following, ideas you are following, please make sure that they agree with the scriptures and with Jesus Christ. 
Because just like in Jesus' day, there are many people claiming to be able to save you, many people claiming to be able to take you to the place where you need to be, or where you would like to be, where it looks good. Jesus is speaking, and he tells his disciples, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven. Don't you love that past tense but present continuous as well? It's about a relationship and we talked about that several weeks ago. We have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. That's, that's where we are today. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I want to focus on those two, two words at the very beginning of le- the, this, this particular section. Lead us. Ardeth, congratulations. Um, Ardeth was hooded last evening. She is now Dr. Dr. Ardeth. And her degree is a doctoral in leadership. Leadership teaching, leadership management. And uh, I fully intend to learn all I can from you. And I want to thank Eric, who is visiting another church today, for being her reader. Okay, Eric's a real smart guy, and, and Ardeth would say, does this sound right? Is this okay? You need people to walk with you like that, and Eric was one of those people for Ardeth in her writing of her thesis. But we want to focus on this word, lead, because today is the first day of the new church year. And we need to know where we're going. And we need to know who's leading us. I just want you to know that that's why I picked the text in Joshua. Here you have Joshua standing before the people, as you just read, and thank you so much for involving us in that reading as if we were those people, because that's exactly how I hope you feel today. I want you to place yourself in that situation. You are standing there before God and before his leadership that he has chosen, and you are saying words like, and we believe this, or and this is what we're going to do, and, and we promise to follow God. That's why I picked that text, because that's where we are today at the beginning of this new church year. We're thinking about where are we going? And who is going to take us there? I want to get one thing straight right now. I may be playing a role in this congregation. I may have accepted a call from the Southern California Conference. I may then have been sent to you by the Southern California Conference. But I am not the church. I am not your savior. As I said to one of my friends this morning, uh, if if you wouldn't mind, I would hope that you would think of me as your best encourager. Yes, it may come with a little point sometime, but I would not be true to scripture if, if, and I could just blame scripture, right? Because if I use scripture and it goes like this to you in your ribs or in your backside, ain't me, okay? I play a role in this congregation. We have a number of people, there's a long list that you saw recently when we voted our leadership team. They said yes to playing roles as well in the way that we go forward. Elders, deacons, deaconesses, Sabbath school teachers, you name it. And there are those who are under the impression that the Holy Spirit is leading them into new ministries. Thank you, Kit. And so 
This leads me to say the leader that I want to introduce to you again, once again, ladies and gentlemen, the leader of this church is God Almighty. And he has sent his Holy Spirit as Jesus promised. I will not leave you without somebody to lead you and to comfort you and to guide you. Like the 23rd Psalm says, the rod and the staff, there's going to be protection. There's going to be guidance. I won't leave you without that, he says. So please, as we go into this new church year, as we set foot into a, a new situation, really, please know that I am firmly committed to seeing God be the leader of our congregation. Lead us not into temptation. There are those who are going about these days teaching that God does not discipline. I would ask them to reread their Bibles. I'm going to say that our Father in heaven is a good Father, and He will take that rod, excuse me, the staff, the rod is for protection against the wolves, He'll take that staff in your life which I learned doesn't have a big, huge crook in it. That's a walking cane. A shepherd's staff has this tiny little crook in the top of it. And I, I asked once, well, where's the big piece? And they said, no, there's no big piece in a shepherd. No, it's, it's got this little crook in it. Why? Because he's not going to grab you around the neck. That would damage you. Now, sometimes my mother says that God grabs you by the scruff of the neck, you know, like you grab a kitten, and the kitten reacts like, natural, totally natural, I'm going to do what mommy says, because mommy's got me by the scruff of the neck, and maybe God does that to us sometimes, but the crook on a shepherd's staff is for the thigh, that as you are possibly going some other way than he is leading, he can gently reach out and gently pull you back. So when you feel those tuggings on your heart, when you are being tempted to go your own way, to go the way that the Bible says will mean you will be separated from God, and we know that separation from God equals death, Yes, it took over 900 years for Adam to die. But every day when he got up and saw things around him dying, he knew that he was now part of the culture of death. Jesus came to save us from that. And so when you feel those tuggings, when you feel those tuggings, remember that you pray, that I pray, lead us not into temptation. And those little tuggings, those little pullings back, that's the staff on your thigh pulling you gently back saying, if you go that way, the end thereof is death. Lead us not into temptation. But, and I love times when there's these juxtapositions of things, but deliver us from evil. Jesus is, is noting here the fact that there is evil and that we are in a great controversy. These are things that, that we teach and that we preach and that sometimes we just use language that doesn't really uh, uh, hit home with the fact. But I'm, I'm going to say some things right now that I hope do not offend you too badly because they have to do with our culture. A culture that, that we may be heavily, heavily invested in. But the culture that we are living in today is not serving God. The culture today that we are, are, are going shopping in, that we are working in, that we are living in, that, that we are caused by maybe our boss to, to do things in that is not in line with the principles of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says to his disciples, when you pray to the Father, 
Pray to him for deliverance from the situation that you find yourself in. And the situation we find ourselves in, friends, is evil. The kingdom of this world is ruled by an individual who knows his time is short. His faith was sealed at the cross. He knows that he's going down. And his interest in you is simply to demonstrate to God that God is weak, that he is a liar, and that when you cooperate with him, you make God look foolish. That's it. If we are to be sorry, when we come into the presence of God, it is to be because we have misrepresented our relationship with Him. Think of it in terms of, I don't know, let's pick on Nordstrom. They call people who work at Nordstrom, Nordies. And they have an entire culture that they teach them. There are things that you must do when you are a Nordy, and there are cameras watching. And if you don't, they will fire you. When you package that package up for that wonderful man who's in the men's department now, he's got a shirt and a tie, you must go around and look them in the eye and hand it to them and say, thank you for shopping at Nordstrom's. This you must do or you will get demerit points and too many demerit points means that you will be fired. Now, we say, oh, that's normal. There are lots of companies like that. Uh-huh. So are we going to look at our relationship with God in the same way? Are we going to care for our relationship with God in the same way? Because this phrase, deliver us from evil, infers that we are living in an evil place from which we need deliverance. Now, we can talk about ultimate deliverance, and we, of course, as Adventist people are looking forward to the second advent, the parousia, the second coming, when Jesus will come back in and when the big change, that's what I call it, the big change will take place. And those who have died will be resurrected. Those who want to be with Jesus will be resurrected. We talk about that a lot. And we talk about that as ultimate salvation. But what about this prayer where Jesus is saying, deliver us from evil. He is saying, you are going to be living in this world and you're, you're, you're going to need to be delivered from being a part of the culture of this world even when you live in it. It's tough. It's, it's something, it's something that I, I want you to know I struggle with every day, just like every one of you. How is it that we are to live in the 21st century and, and be good, I'm just going to say, be good citizens, be good Americans, and yet at the same time, more than that, be good citizens of the, of the heavenly kingdom, be good kingdom of God citizens. Jesus says you won't be able to do it. So when you pray, you better ask for deliverance. To deliver your mind, to deliver your appetites, to deliver your, your entire existence from the clutches of the evil one whose only intent is destruction. And if you don't know what that looks like, please turn on CNN and see some of the extra footage that they're showing these days about what happened earlier this week. Drunken revelers running from a gunman shooting people in a barrel. I don't know. I don't know if you need any more graphic a picture of the state of being in this world today because that's exactly what I'm talking about. There is one who seeks your destruction. Every single day he is after you. And he is up in the air. And he does have a vantage. And you are powerless to know where he is and when he's coming at, when he's coming at you or how he's going to come at you. That's every one of us. That's where we are. We live in this situation. 
how, how are we going to live in this situation? I don't know about you, but I'm right now in my mind emotionally connecting with the look on some of those people's faces with, 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 with that picture of that man over top of his wife who has been shot. Guys, this, this is our situation right now. That's a metaphor of where we are in the world today. Some really wonderful things were said at Ardeth's graduation by, her, by the speaker. I wrote them down. He basically asked, what are you going to do with your capabilities now? What are you going to do with what you know to help other people? To connect with other people. And I knew that you know, he, couldn't, he, he couldn't be a preacher at that moment uh, in, in church. So I said, I, I'm, I, I'm just going to take what he said and I'm going to say, you know what? God has given us capabilities. God has given us power. God gives us intuition. God gives us talents. I said to, to one of my friends here yesterday, I said, look, you'll never hear me preach about gifts without preaching about mission." Don't come to me ever and tell me that you can't do something that God is asking you to do. Don't come to me and tell me that. Because I serve an almighty God. I serve a God that says, if I want you to do this, I will give you the talents. I will gift you with whatever you need in order to get it done. So in answer to the question of how should we live in the situation that looks and feels just like Las Vegas earlier this week, that's how we do it. We put on the armor of God and we stand firm in his power, in his strength, by his word. Now how do you, how do you come to know what that is? Well, it's simple. It's what we teach the kids. Read your Bibles. Pray. Get on the telephone with those people that you haven't talked to in a long time and ask how they're doing. Care for people. We're putting together the idea of life groups. You'll hear more about it as we proceed into this quarter. And the idea is that as a church, it just has to be, folks. It has to be. If I'm passionate about one thing, it is that we as a church who say we love each other need to have a system by which we can do that. And so it is that my mantra these days is that we need to live our lives in life groups. However that comes about. Maybe, maybe one will develop around the good grief with Kit that there'll be a group of people that will come to care about each other. And when I say care, I mean, you're going to know when that person's birthday is. You know what I'm saying? You're going to take them out to eat. You're, they're going to be on your Christmas list. They're going to be people who you want to do life with. Please, folks, help us as leaders to come up with ways in which you would like to be in groups. Because my dream about this congregation sitting right here as I look at you on Sabbath morning is that there will be a group and another one and another one and another one. And in that group, there will be people who know each other, people who have talked to each other that week and people who have encouraged each other that week because things are happening. Nellie, your neighbor, her niece, was one of the ones killed in Vegas. One of the little girls that may be here today, her kindergarten teacher, same, same person. Okay? This is not far away. You know, this is not a nuke in North Korea. This is Vegas, where off-duty teachers and other service people were at a concert for fun. And they died. The opportunity to talk to them now is gone. 
The opportunity for them to bless us is gone. So as I was struggling with this with Linda, uh, you know, how, how do we help this little girl whose mother called this week and said, look, is there anything going on at the church that will help, help us as parents, help us as parents to help our child, our five-year-old child, deal with the fact that her teacher was shot dead in these United States? I mean, come on, this is not Bosnia. So I said, look, tell mom, your child is going to come here, there's going to be a children's church, and then they're going to make 60 sack lunches for red-blooded Americans who don't have a bed in Santa Clarita. Yeah, that's right, there are 60 beds Rail, railroad, turn right on Drayton. Go through the industrial section, go right to the back of the road, and you'll see an area that is cordoned off by a green fence. Inside there are 60 beds. Last year, Henry Mayo gave them a five-piece shower unit. Do you know what else they need? They need sewage as in sewer, to take care of the sewage. They're not even hooked up. Yeah, Linda and I went to the meeting and we found out this is what Santa Clarita does right now for homeless people coming up into the winter time now where it's going down close to freezing. 40 beds for men, 20 beds for women. It's not enough. And I, I, I don't know, I, I, I've had an experience in my own life um, uh, where, where I've been dealing with a, a family member um, who potentially could be homeless. So right now, this issue is very personal to me because I'm thinking, how do I, how, how, how do I treat what God has given me when I have a brother who is asking? Jason, if you're watching, I love you. God has blessed this country, and he has given us the opportunity to tell people about the good news that he is coming very, very soon as Seventh-day Adventists. But it is my hope that in the coming year that we will say to ourselves, we want to live, we want to laugh, and we want to love and that includes anyone who is breathing. Because they were given life by God. Doesn't matter who they are or where they come from. If they're alive on planet Earth today, God loves them. And he has called us to tell them that Jesus is coming back very soon. But in the meantime... <laughs> In the meantime, come on now, I'm getting, getting real preachy here. In the meantime, he has said, I want to give you life, and I want to give it to you abundantly. Press down. You know why it's pressed down and running over? So that we can share it. So that we won't be going, oh, I don't know if I have enough. No, no, we're going to be going, whoa, I can save some for the next me. No, no, let's say, I can give some to somebody who doesn't have. That's why he's given us what we have. We just need to make the decision. That's what I've decided. We just need to make the decision to share. I believe that's why Jesus came, because he came to show us the unselfish life. So in closing, I, I ask you uh, uh, to, to look there at that Joshua text in your mind again and, and, to, and to say to yourself, if this is the God, if this is the God who's going to lead us into 2018 and beyond, am I ready to say, yes, I will follow this God because this God wants for me to live he wants me to laugh. He wants me to love. If you're ready to say that, I just want you to go, yes. yes. All right.
Now we have a little mission statement that we've been working on. I want to give it to you again. I'm trying to memorize it. It isn't that hard. I just probably haven't spent enough time, but here it is. To actively seek, celebrate, and share God's transforming love. You like that? Let me say it again. To actively, this is not passively, this is actively, seek, celebrate, and share God's transforming love. See if we can memorize that. See if we can let the Holy Spirit sink that into our hearts because that's what I've been talking about. And if you said yes just a moment ago, that's what you said yes to. As the elders and deacons went over this, I want you to know they said yes. I have said yes. And I've also warned them, we've used a big word here. I don't know, Pastor Greg liked using big words, but you obviously like using big words, and you understand what the word transforming means, right? Right? Okay? So this is a high standard. I want you to know, church, this is a high standard. And I've, I've told the elders and I've told the deacons, if you put that word in there, we need to be serious about it. Because we need to say to ourselves, is coming to church on Sabbath morning transforming lives? Are more people in love with Jesus because we do what we do? These are going to be the questions as we go forward that we're going to have to ask ourselves in, in, in personal ways and also in corporate ways. Because I, I can tell you that there's a lot of what we have done maybe in the past that has just been comfortable. It's because we like it. But it isn't helping. It's tough for me to say this. It really is. Because I'm saying it to myself first. My comfort is not the mission. And if we want to stay on mission with Jesus Christ, we're going to have to embrace the fact that he has brought transforming love into this world. And he is asking people to live in this evil place under his power, with his strength, with his ideas, and go forward in his love. So if that's, if that's where you want to go, I want you to know, I, I get really excited about that. Really excited. And, 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 the, and basically it's because it's saying that God is the leader and I serve a big God. A big God that can do anything. He can raise the dead. He, he can do anything. So if that excites you and, and, and you, you know, want to be a part of that, then stick around, uh, tell your friends. And, and that's what we're going to try to do going forward. We're going to have these children's church things. We're going to have other stuff going on here in, in church on Sabbath. And then we want to start these, these life groups, okay? And please, please understand that this is not about eight weeks and quit. So just, that's why I'm not calling them small groups, okay? Just forget that. Forget that. We're calling them life groups because we need as families to gather other families together and to hold hands just like people were holding hands as they were fleeing from the gunmen. The heroes in Vegas were the people who stuck around and gathered people together and then ushered them to safety. My friends, we're Californians. We're waiting for the big one, aren't we? Are we ready for that as a church? Do we know what we're going to do? We have a seismologist in our midst. Yes, Richard Guy. He can tell you all about L.A. and how it's doing. Yeah, but what would we do if we were affected? What would the Santa Clarita Church do? This is just one of the thoughts that goes through my head about what church can be and do now to help people to live, to laugh, and to love. Let's go forth in grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.